happy that you did this sharing this session because it is a result of uh, cooperative work between a lot of people. So I'm going to quickly tell you about the, this story, which is more important than practical results that are going to be published very soon. So we call it a helicopter and see the pollution acquisition experiment, but then realize that there's not just acquisition, it's assessment. And that's the main goal of our work. And we propose this not only as an experiment, but also as an alternative platform for improving the air quality assessment in our city, and we hope to do this at national level. This is the outline of my presentation. It's gonna be a little bit longer, but you can read it from there. But the story focuses on the fact that I'm not a chemical engineer or environmental engineer. My background is in control and systems engineering, and I was never interested in about air pollution. I was more interested in data assimilation, base estimation, systems and controls, hydrophysical systems, and artificial intelligence. But after looking for a good research topic, with uh, our colleagues from two Delft University in the Netherlands, I realized that there's something more important than uh, having a new algorithm. It's trying to do science for helping to a better world. And I joined a team of scientists on this quest. This is my city, and uh, all of you know about this phenomenon, but I'm going to move forward into what I picked up as an example, as a complex model, CTM model, for playing with my data simulation, my matrices and my base theory, and how to build a new mathematical tool. But during this task, we realized that it is more something more important than mathematical modeling or just running models like crazy. It's how to understand what is going on when you take a large-scale complex system and put it into a very complex terrain as the northwestern of South America. Because of Colombia, it's not an easy uh, country to model because of topography, land use, land cover, protected areas, biodiversity. Any model can run perfect in our country. So the first one of the model was something as weird as it is. And I want you to point out that there is a spe specific point, and this is my city. This is Bogota, and this is uh, Hali. And through this presentation, we'll you would know that our concern was not necessarily people, but also ecosystems and agriculture. The, I hope this is all okay, perfect. When you have a large scale model like that, you start to play, and let's see how will be the impact of the big cities into the protected areas. Someone like Nicolas Pinel will think about it because he's a biologist, I wasn't thinking about it. But he realized that we may be affecting more the protected areas, and our problem is, are not gonna be just like we're gonna die. We are going to be running out of water because we depend on our ecosystems to uh, feed a lot of people and to provide what, all what we need for agriculture and also, of course, for the development of the country. We run the model, we have these nice results, and then, well, let's say, through modeling, how can we assess the air quality in our city? This is the main network sensors in our metropolitan area, and that's why I was also very happy that the former presenter was talking about Helsinki, because it's a, a worldwide reference for metropolitan area assessment of air quality and exposure models in, uh, for, it, for it, people exposure models. And you can tell right now that for running this particular tight valley, seven kilometers wide, like 60 long, you need to perform four nested domain simulations. And when you have two PhD students looking after data simulation, you will go through ensemble common filtering approach or variational approach from surface network, satellite, data, but what are you gonna have, uh, do if you have these conditions? And I decided to be very worried about it. Even if we had these nice results for data simulation, uh, just for showing how we can, right now we can reproduce the daily cycle. But we were fine by doing the nested simulations. Data simulation was doing great. Then we had the tropomy data uh, working perfect in order to run the data simulation. But 
And he was feeling that something was left and how to improve our accuracy with a very complicated economical situation, not that much funding for science, we need to get creative. Elena Montilla is a physics engineer and Angela Rendon is an expert in meteorology. And I called them and said, what do you think if we put a bunch of instruments into an helicopter and try to get some data from a microcamplify? They said, of course, you're crazy. Yes, I am. But I said, can we do that? And she answered, if you can find an helicopter, we can do it. So I called the Air Force commander of this base here and I said, do you believe in science? We have something to do together. So we got a helicopter from the Air Force and they helped us a lot on building our experiment. So quickly I'm going to show you the features of our experiment and slowly I'm going to provide you details on each instrument. So I managed to buy this thing and try to build something useful to put into the helicopter. Elena decided that we need to have double experiments inside the military helicopter and uh, with a certain load in order to compare because I'm not interested in accuracy. I'm interested in to establish a very consistent measurement because it's very difficult to get super accuracy or precision in your instruments. And it's worse when you are measuring from the air. You have a lot of things ongoing out there. Someone joined us for the experiment and she said, why don't you try to have some nanofibers to capture the PM? Let's check if we can make it. So we put everything on the helicopter. The devices are, and I'm sorry, this is quite a competition for you right now. This is a Colombian device that a bunch of young people develop as their option for measuring with aerospace technology. This is a can size sat device. Very nice and beauty. They already went through a competition. They won the challenge of the balloon space team with a nice photograph device. So this small device already went that height. So let's put it into the helicopter and let's see what is going to happen. If you want to buy some, just let me know. We also took another technology that we used to, uh, to have on the surface to measure the deposition of particles. So are we crazy? Yes, we are. So why don't you just take a substrate from this device and put it into the helicopter? Let's see what is going to happen. And there's also a really, really good scientist in our university, and she's a specialist in the nano world. So she's making nanofibers in order to capture the, um, the particles, and she can she develop patterns on this um, nice uh, thing that he has a polymer nanofiber and organic substance. I'm not an expert in this, and she's capable to put them together at nanoscale. So she's now able to design any nanofiber you can uh, use or you can imagine at different temperatures for different uses. And finally, these biologists, people, they say, okay, why don't you just try to measure the damage at cellular level and molecular level? Go ahead, we went through the experiment. I'm running out of time. And I don't know if you can just help me out. Okay, the fact is that as an engineer slash mathematician, not interested in air quality, we managed to get together biologists, meteorologists, physics engineers, and um, specialists in nanofibers, and a lot of people willing to join efforts. That's how science is supposed to be done. And we wanted to do this, not because of we want to be a super scientist, because of we want a better future for us. And the Air Force joined us in this, because of I was very sad of not having the budget to have um, military aircraft, such as the California wildfires last year team. They had this nice plane, but we have helicopters. We can have helicopters. And we can be scientists, and the government will help us to do this. Some results, as I mentioned, I wasn't looking for precision, neither accuracy. I was looking for consistency. Because of this is underdeveloped. And I wanted to check if I was going to be able to perform data assimilation with the data I was acquiring during the experiment. Remember, my field is the data assimilation. 
but we find a platform to test our hypothesis about the dynamics of the polygons within the valley. On the contrary of Sao Paulo or any other city in the world, the most polluted part of the, part of the city is the rich neighborhoods because of they are in a super hill and the traffic is very slow. They are just accelerating and breaking and that happens the entire day. And someone in the last year, one, uh, one part of our team uh, demonstrated that the susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility of the particles are more higher in that part of the city than in the rest of the city. So the rich babies are in trouble. Okay, our platform is, was also useful to test that kind of behavior. So remember, this is the Air Force Base, so we went north and we, uh, Angela and Elena designed an experiment at three different heights because it's a very tight valley and we needed to try to extract the information from a vertical profile. And uh, yeah, it was kind of sad. And here is when we flew very close to traffic corridor at the height. And this is nice, I'm leaving it around here, so I'm doing great. But the problem was that we thought that this area, which is under development, wasn't having the problem we actually had. This is in a national airport, airport, and this is the new city. So if you took a really good look at the first simulations, when this city will grow, this is going to spread the pollutants across the metropolitan area. So this is a result that someone in a decision-making position will use in order to plan the growth of the city. And I was also happy because of Elena Montilla, former postdoc of Judith, says, I don't have any device to put into the helicopter. So don't be worried. We're going to get nice results that you can use in your LiDAR system. So now, to we be able to design a good LiDAR system under beautiful conditions, we're going to work harder to repeat this experiment because now it is known at national level and we're going to repeat the experiment at the end of the month and we're going to have our devices and a military fleet across the country. And this is the PM profiles, two different particle counters. Also, uh, these are the profiles across the center of the metropolitan area, industrial zone. This is a south, southern city. This is close to the stadium with the soccer games. And this is the northeastern part of the city. So you can tell about the different profiles, but check this hour of the experiment. This is not the rush hour either the noon. So we're getting a little bit worried and complicated. And, but it was a problem. We were very confident about the tropomy instrument and my PhD student was very happy and said, okay, if we run this, I can compare with the total color of the instrument. Bah. The day of the experiment, we didn't get the data. Oh. But we're gonna try to plan with the people of the Netherlands about what would be a really good day to acquire the data during the experiment. It was the first time. Oh, this is, I'm gonna take two minutes left to show you this. I mentioned that we put on top of the helicopter the nanofibers and also some boron substrates that are used in the passive emitter sigma two. Why? Because of, we are not satisfied with the bulk chemistry. We wanted to take a deep look at the composition and morphology at molecular level. And we can use a microscopic, um, yeah, an electronic microscope to check into the morphology through some images and EDX chemistry. So we are breathing a little piece of time and we are breathing a little piece of metallic aggregate. Nice, I'm going to die. Another nice result is to see how nanofibers capture this material and test it that we can use them in order to provide a new and improved filters for uh, people and also industries. And 
they were thought that I have not understand them very well, but I'll try to do my best. These are the sales. Isn't that incredible? And what they produce, mix it and have a culture of this. And my time is over, and I just wanted to show you one specific thing. Yeah, the cells are dying, but when you take a look at the molecular damage of the cells, um, at that height, the particle matter is not necessarily able to make this kind of damage. It sets a hypothesis to use a little more of understanding of the composition of the particles out there. And compared with previous results, we are very optimistic. This is our proposal, and I'd love to take your questions, but remember I'm not a biologist, so I hope you write down your questions in order to address to my colleagues. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you heard about us in the future. Thank you very much, Olga, for your really inspiring talk. And I think we can take one quick question. Very nice talk. There have been increasing use of chemical data simulation to reduce the model bias, improve the model predictability. On the other hand, a group of people thought chemical data simulation is just like a bandage which is limited in the fact that it cannot uncover the underlying science. So what is your insight in how chemical data simulation can help us to improve the scientific understanding? Thank you very much, that's a really good question. As a data simulation, well, scientific one, I think that the understanding of the parameters and the distribution of the parameters in a very solid mathematical model will help us to distinguish between different nonlinear states of the system. Chemistry is chemistry, and it's not going to change. But if you have your chemistry running into a very complicated um, land, such as Colombia, the data simulation will help you out what are the uncertainties in different parameters. I was talking to Baron that we don't have really good emission inventory, but through data simulation, by using the real data and acquiring to the model, we can try to estimate the emissions factors. Then, data simulation will help you out to understand what is missing in your modeling task, to help you out to find out what are the challenges and the opportunities, and to be facing what is important from the chemistry point of view. That is not a solution for all the problems. It is one tool that you can use to provide very good decisions, yeah, this is it, to the people that is trying to build the future. And it's not a question because of, uh, your question is related to how to get the data simulation close to the ones that are focusing their efforts into improving their quality. And this is our mice, and it is a rodent we are using to social acquisition of knowledge because of what we want to do is to use our results through data simulation to make the children and everybody realize how important is what is uh, what, what we do in terms of the understanding of the underlying dynamics of a chemistry transfer model. So this is a lot of people working on this strategy and data simulation will be just a framework for this kind of decision making. Thank you very much again, Olga.